Facebook, DSV Channel 279, we're all across the world on 3 I'm Alfred Okansi, tonight here on your election command centre as the Electoral Commission prepares for the December 7 presidential parliamentary elections. Quite a number of concerns have been raised about some of the processes. Uh, we have a comprehensive conversation on some of these concerns raised, plus the latest information coming through, the number of polling stations that will be used during this election. We have it coming through from the Electoral Commission, fresh on the plate here on Ghana tonight. Stay with us. Also, we're back full circle to the era of military raiding mining sites, seizing mining equipment and burning them as part of operations to rid mines of illegal mining. I'm talking about the forest reserve and the water bodies. But is this a tried and tested approach to dealing with this menace? We speak to those who have been there before and been associated with all the operations gone by in the past. Another heartbreak, really. Ghana's Africa Cup of Nations hopes is now on the ice after a draw against Sudan in Accra earlier today left the Black Stars third in that group. Tonight, we assessed today's match and also the chances of the Black Stars going forward. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna tonight, and I, well, as always, you're an integral part of the conversation. We have manifesto check here on your election command center. Connect with us on Facebook and on X. The hashtag is gonna tonight. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The National Democratic Congress NDC has kicked against the request by the Electoral Commission to select party agents to be trained for the printing of notice of poll and ballot papers. Speaking to TV3, NDC Deputy Director of Elections and IT, Dr. Rashid Tanko, said the meeting goes beyond the party agents, hence the need to involve the party leadership. The meeting should have been for party uh, leadership and not for agents, because most of the decisions they wanted to put on was for leadership to take decisions on them. One was about the notice of pool. You needed, they needed us to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. And we think that this forum was not a platform for that. And interestingly, all the political parties all agree mm -hmm. that, look, the party agent doesn't have that uh, mandate to do that. It's rather the principals. And so we've proposed that tomorrow we should have another meeting where principals will come. They will bring the notice of pool. Then we all sign onto it. When we sign off, that one document will be used for the printing of the notice of pool. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Professor Johnson Nyakon Buampong, is to remain at post after a Cape Coast High Court ruled that he remains as Vice Chancellor. The Ghana Tertiary Education Commission says it is satisfied with the directive as that would ensure peace and harmony among management members in the school. All that we can say is that we've come to brief the GTEC about the unfortunate thing that has been happening at the UCC. But now, by the grace of the Almighty God, the cause is that the earlier decision had been set aside until the final determination. So Vice Chancellor is going to continue with his work until the court determines the final case. GTEC and the Ministry. The VC is no more restrained. He can go on to perform his duties. And so for now, that is the position. It's a court ruling. So whether you are satisfied or not satisfied, you have to obey the ruling of the court. <music> Vice Presidential Candidate of the NDC, Professor Jane Nopokwajiman, says the party will restructure the education sector to make it better if voted for in the December general elections. She accused the NPP government for messing up with the sector to the detriment of children's future. The professor was addressing party faithful during a campaign tour in the Eastern region. <laughs> Our children's education is important, but not the one that children go to school for two weeks and come back home for vacation for three months. We will come and make it better and not cancel anything as being peddled around. <music> 
NPP running mate Dr. Matthew Poko Prempe has urged voters in the Afram Plains north of the eastern region to reconsider their long standing support for the National Democratic Congress NDC. He was addressing chiefs, community members, and party faithful during a campaign tour of the constituency. <laughs> If I take a look at the underdevelopment in Afram Plains and you still vote for NDC, it baffles me. If you take a look at where I come from, when you talk about roads, schools, hospitals, electricity, water supply and unemployment, there are a lot over there. So when I came to Afram Plains, I was expecting to see some improvement here. Ghana coach Otoado expressed his frustration after the Black Stars were held to a goalless draw by Sudan in their 2025 African Cup of Nations AFCON qualifier on Thursday. The results leaves Ghana in a difficult position, needing wins in their remaining matches to secure qualification for the tournament in Morocco. Speaking to the media after the game, Ado lamented the missed opportunities but remained confident about Ghana's chances in the next match. Uh, this is football. This is football sometimes very, very hard, difficult for us. Um, so now it paints even more. The Niger game paints even more. And also the last minute goal against Angola paints even more because today, again, we did well and there's nothing much I can, I can, I can say. And um, just the result, and this is the most important thing in football, it's not correct. And um, I think we deserve to win, but it didn't. And we will stay positive. Oh, that's Otuado there. We deserve to win. They played better. We didn't win. I mean, that's really the reality of what happened earlier today. And a number of you have been reacting to this quite, quite angrily. And we're going to get into it. Uh, we have a few persons joining us to talk about what's the next step for the Black Stars. But this is Ghana tonight. And as always, you're an integral part of the conversation. Coming up next, we're going to your election command center as the Electoral Commission prepares for the December 7 poll, some 68 days away from today. Quite a number of concerns have been raised about some of the processes we have and that are put in place, as the Electoral Commission put in place ahead of this election. And we're going to get into this right now, and we remain your election command center. There was some consensus earlier today when both the NDC and the MPP both raised issues about their request by the Electoral Commission to, as it were, select party agents to be trained for the printing of notice of polls and ballot papers. The Deputy Director of Elections and IT for the NDC, Dr. Rashid Tango Computer, indicated the meeting goes beyond the party agents, hence the need to involve the party leadership, the MPP's representative there as well, the Director of Elections of the party, Evans de Macon, backed the decision by the Electoral Commission to engage the political parties in the electoral process and also demanded that some signings be, be done before the, the issue of printing kicks in. Take a look. Meetings should have been for party uh, leadership and not for agents because most of the decisions they wanted to put on was for leadership to take decisions on them. One was about the notice of pool. You needed, they needed us to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. And we think that this forum was not a platform for that. And interestingly, all the political parties all agree mm -hmm. that, look, the party agents doesn't have that uh, mandate to do that. It's rather the principals. And so we've proposed that tomorrow we should have another meeting where principals will come. They will bring the notice of pool. Then we all sign on to it. When we sign off, that one document will be used for the printing of the notice of pool. NPP Director of... ...together that the, the EC must come to the party with the sample notice of pool for us to sign off. Signing off means that we want to make sure that the candidate picture is clear, the names are well spelled, party symbol, 
it's clear party name was spelled before they can go ahead to do the final print so but once printing comes out uh, you cannot raise issues about it so we need to sign off before printing can start that is the decision for today he called on Oh, yes, th th this time there appears to be some consensus on the, on the part of the MPP and the NDC on, this, on these issues as raised. Uh, some things that have to be done before the printing takes place. The Electoral Commission had communicated that printing was supposed to start mm -hmm. tomorrow. But the Executive Director for the Institute for Democratic Governance, IDEG, Dr. Emmanuel Akwete, also waited in today, um, indicating that the potential for violence in, in this year's election is very high. He has therefore called on the Electoral Commission to play its role as a fair arbiter. Dr. Akwete was speaking at the Ghana Speaks High Level Forum in 2024, which discussed how to advance peace, unity, and national cohesion in Ghana. We'll bring that later to you. But also, the programs manager for, for CDD, Paul Osei Kofor, called on the Electoral Commission to engage in broader consultations with major stakeholders ahead of this year's election to minimize the suspicion that surrounds the Electoral Commission's own work and also to ensure that there's robust verification processes to reduce the potential violence. Take a look. The MPP wants to uh, stay in power and overrule the eight-year convention. The NDC want the convention to stay. And you know, our winner takes all politi politics, heightens and polarizes the political environment. So this election must be taken with all the seriousness, but the results or the, the, the strategy should be to ensure the processes are fair and transparent and they can easily be validated by all citizens, not only political parties, uh, with experienced power alternations three times. Uh, in 2000, we experienced it. In 2008, we did experience the same. In 2016, we did the same thing. Even when uh, His Excellency, the former President John Mahama, has served us one term, and we accepted the process. I think what is important is to ensure that the processes leading to the declaration of the results remain very transparent for the public to make their own judgment and understand it. And for me, one critical issue is uh, making polling stations results very transparent for citizens so that they can even do a parallel tabulation of the results. The media can also have access to the results from the polling station. And this is just mathematics. If we can all have access to the polling station results, we can just benchmark the collation processes. And in Nigeria, there was a very landmark introduction to the electoral landscape. That is the uh, INEC results viewing portal. They understood some of the legitimacy challenges facing. Well, uh, that's a CDD director of programs. He, re he makes reference to Nigeria. Well, the former president of Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan, together with some eminent persons in the ECOWAS sub-region, were in Ghana a few days ago to also put in a word ahead of this election, December 7. They say that Ghana is a critical component of the ECOWAS architecture, reason why they cannot sit aloof and wait till election day. They would want to be part of the conversation to ensure a free and fair, transparent election. Take a look. If you go to a country, we interact with all class of people. And the first question I used to ask is that, do you have confidence in the Electoral Commission if the citizens say they have confidence in the Electoral Commission, then you smile. Then do you have confidence in the security system? If you tell you, yes, we have confidence in the security system, then you can, in fact, take your coffee and disappear. But where they say one thing or the other in these two institutions, then you know that you have a work to do. And that is why we're here. Because when one country goes down, a country like Ghana steps down, will be major crisis in ECOWAS and it will affect the rest of Africa. So we want the best for the uh, elections in Ghana and that is why we are here. That's why they're here. In fact, they, they called on the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Kofu Dampari. That's why they, that, uh, that's uh, good luck Jonathan made that statement. We'll hear from the IGP in a bit. But Dr. Jonathan Asanchochri is a political analyst, a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Coast. He's joining us on Zoom. Uh, Dr. Asanchochri, appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight.
Thank you and good evening to you, Alfred, and to your viewers. Great stuff. Now, so there's that demand for a free, fair, transparent election. That is the utmost responsibility of the Electoral Commission. The, the Commission can do so much. But what are the basic elements that you would want to see to convince you that this election that will take place on December 7 is and will be free, fair, and transparent? Well, um, let me say good evening once again. Um, I think that what the EC will have to do is to carry along every process of the way, all the stakeholders that matter, especially the main opposition party and other minority parties. Uh, secondly, um, those that have been appointed at the EC, whether they are politically tinted or not, they will have a, a lot of, you know, they have a Herculean task on their hands, especially where you are not exuding that kind of confidence, you know, uh, when it comes to the stakeholders. Because if you listen to the former president of Nigeria, you know, His Excellency, good luck, Jonathan, then you see that the caveat is that the EC, the people, the electorate, the citizenry must have confidence in them. So confidence is key. But where you have a situation where the Afrobarometer information that came out puts the confidence of the ordinary citizen in the EC at a very low rank, then obviously there is cause to, to worry. And that is the more reason why you will understand and appreciate the fact that every step on the way, the NDC seem to have a problem. But that in itself is part of the check system to ensure that the EC does right. The, the other thing that we need to see is to ensure that the process is free and fair. And how does that happen? Um, in areas of, let's say, um, um, uh, collection, uh, compilation of data, i.e. registration, opening limited registration, voter transfer, suppression of voter registration exercise in certain parts of the country, you know, uh, putting administrative bottlenecks, you know, by making the process a bit expensive beyond the reach of the minority party, so to speak. And all of these things could lead to some kind of exclusion of major stakeholders. And so this, these processes that I've outlined, I think that along the line, they must be transparently done because that is part of the process of ensuring a free and fair, you know, election about the, the specific instance of engagement. I hear the CDD talk about the Electoral Commission expanding its tentacles when it comes to the persons and institutions they engage, broader engagement with all stakeholders. In, in what form should that take, quickly, before we go? Well, broader engagement, because, for example, you want to print out the, the ballot, definitely you have to engage them. And um, in areas of transfer of votes, you need to engage the middle stakeholders. These are some of the things that will exude confidence, you know, in the EC. Other than that, every process, it will breed suspicion. And the broader engagement is the fact that not only the political parties that are the stakeholders, you need to also engage, you know, some of these CSOs and other uh, uh, personalities that matter within uh, the, the stakeholder consultation, because it is very important. That is the only way that when the results come out, it will be what, accepted. I see. And, and maybe beyond this, uh, should we now make some time and pay attention to the processes for the appointment of the Electoral Commission Chair? Because I've, I've had in conversations with many who say that that's the root of the problem of the, of the lack of confidence and the suspicion for the Electoral Commission, in addition to what the Commission itself does as well. Certainly. Uh, I think that was even the first point I, I put out there according to the list, but I skipped that and looked at, I said, the process, those that are appointed, the process of the appointment itself. We need people who are not politically exposed. That is the number one factor. That is the only thing that will ensure that there is that kind of confidence within the EC. But if you have those who are politically tinted, no matter what you do, you will see that 
even when in your genuineness of heart you are doing the right thing for the stakeholders, they will still have to look at it from a suspicious angle before they will be able to trust the process. That is something that we find ourselves in currently. And so what the EC did last two weeks or so thereabout with this IPAC is one particular process of ensuring that there is that confidence restored as far as the EC is concerned. But how do you even think of printing ballot when you don't, you're not given the final register, you know, to the, the stakeholders? That is two steps forward and a step backwards. And that is something that the EC, I just don't understand because every now you are creating some kind of suspicion. It, it is very illogical that you will want to print out ballot when you've not given the final register. Because if you do, then if there are some botanists that ought to be cleared, then they will draw attention before, before you print out the ballot. And right. I think it is, it is something that they will have to hack into the voice of wisdom in that angle. And I, and I do thank you so much for your thoughts on this. Dr. Jonathan Asanchochi, appreciate your time here on Ghana Tonight. Yes, indeed. Remain your election command center. Dr. Jonathan Asanchochi is a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, a political analyst as well. The IGP, Dr. George Ekufodampari, at that same engagement when uh, the former president of Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan, His Excellency, called on him. Also had a few words to share about the processes put in place by the Ghana Police Service to ensure that the security on that day will do their job professionally. Take a look. Over the years, we used to plan from the point of view of security towards our election as an event. But in recent times, we have institutionalized and mainstream election security in our all operations. We want to assure you, the good people of Ghana and our friends across the world, that once again, we will come out of this as a strong nation, election that has been peaceful, an election that everybody will accept that, yes, it is better than the previous one in terms of all the efforts that we are putting in to ensure that we get that. Well, so that's the IGP there, Dr. George Kufo Dampari. And, and today, hot on the plate, coming through not too long ago, the Electoral Commission has released the number of polling stations that would be used on election day, December 7th, some 68 days, of, that's 58 days away from today. Now, take a look at this. Uh, total number of polling stations, 40,975. That's according to the data coming through right now from the Electoral Commission, 40,975. And the breakdown, based on what w w was given to us, the special voting centers will be 328. And then on election day, December 7, 40,647 polling stations are going to be used. So the special voting, which all things being equal, will take place on December 1, which will have journalists and, and the security agencies, uh, personnel who would be on duty on election day, all of us voting on that day. 328 polling stations will be used on that day. But on election day, December 7, 40,647 polling stations are going to be used. Now, what we do know, based on analysis in previous years, and I'm going to show you that in a bit as we, we go on here on, on Ghana tonight, that in 2020, we had a little over 33,600 polling stations. Right? So what we are seeing now is over 7,000 increase in polling stations between the year 2020 and 2024. And that is obviously due to, you know, population, the, popul the voter population increased and, and number of persons who are eligible to vote has gone up. And this trajectory we see over at least the last six to eight elections that we, we've had. And if we look at the, between 2016 and 2020, there was about almost a 4,000 increase in the number of polling stations that uh, were added within that period 
of that election. So now we are seeing over 7,000 polling stations added between 2020 and 2024. That's what we're seeing. If you go on the Electoral Commission website, you'll see the number of polling stations that were used in the year 2020, there's a little over 33,600. So 7,000 we are seeing right now uh, going into election day, December 7. We remain your election command center. Coming up next here on Ghana tonight on a matter that is environmental, it's a political, it is very much so about lives. We're back full circle up next to the era of military raiding mining sites, seizing mining equipment and burning them as part of operations to raid the mining. Yeah, that's the water bodies and also the forest reserves of illegal mining. But is this a tried and tested approach to dealing with illegal mining? That's the question on the minds of many this evening as to how this renewed effort and mergers can work as announced by government yesterday. Well, earlier today, uh, there was the, the military deployment as part of the new measures put in place by government to deal with illegal mining, as was announced yesterday. The military is back to action only a few hours after government announced this enhanced measures of dealing with illegal mining. Earlier, 18 champ farms, 10 industrial water pumps, machines, and also others were bent in the eastern region following the deployment of the military personnel to stop illegal mining activities. Now, the operation occurred on the Brim River in the Etiwa East and West districts. However, no arrests were made. Colonel Eric Tenadu is a commander of the Operation Halt Task Force. He spoke earlier to the media. Take a look. The deployment is in response to government's renewed efforts to stop Galamse following pressure from organized labor and the general public. The Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners partnered the military to undertake the exercise. As part of this operation, 18 Chanfan machines commonly used for illegal gold extraction along with other industrial equipment were seized and burnt on the brinks of the Birim River. The Birim River, a critical water source, has suffered extensive pollution due to the illegal activities of miners, prompting swift action by the authorities. Following its pollution, part of the Denso River, which feeds the Wager Dam, has also been affected badly. The military-led tax force made its first stop at Inunim in the Tiwa East District of the Eastern Region. We'll hear from uh, the leader of the deployment in a bit. We'll have a conversation on that. But Dr. Jamal Tonzoa is a former legal advisor to Operation Vanguard. That's the first military-led operation by government to tackle illegal mining in this country. He is also a lecturer at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, Gimpa Law School. Dr. Jamal Tonzoa, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. First stop... These measures as announced by government kicked in today. We've seen the military back. Ten chamfans, about 18 chamfans we have seen have been burnt. And 10 water pumps seized. You've been there before. You, 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 I mean, knowing how Operation Vanguard worked, as excavators were bent and so on. Is this an effective approach to take again? Alfred, not at all. It's not going to make any difference. Um, <laughs> you'd recall that when we, in fact, the scale of what we, what has been introduced is not going to be up to the scale of the Joint Task Force when we had, um, you know, Operation Vanguard. Now, Operation Vanguard would have had troops who, which would have numbered up to between 600 and 800. And you would also recall that during Operation Vanguard, arrests of several hundreds, thousands of people, suspected illegal miners were, were conducted. You also had um, even exhibits like excavators, which numbered over 500. And you know other exhibits like firearms, explosives, um, water pumps, industrial water pumps, and washing machines and all that. But it amounted to nothing. In fact, I even have a problem with the kind of burning or destruction of some of these equipment. Point is that you would 
I agree that they are powered by diesel. And if you fire, you know, these use weapons to fire these um, grinders, Shanfang, they call them, on water platforms, what are you doing? You're actually introducing uh, diesel, some contamination or pollution into the water bodies. It doesn't help matters. And the bending as well doesn't help matters. So it's not a well thought through thing. I mean, but that's even beside the, you know, illegality that has to that goes along that i mean because strictly speaking we are talking about suspects here you've not had them convicted by a court of law so um what's the basis of of destroying uh, you know property and uh, violating people's constitutionally guaranteed right to um, own property I see. And I want to, uh, you, you've raised concerns about the involvement of the military in this fight against illegal mining. Why is that? I mean, and, and, and based on what we are seeing now, we're back to that particular point again. And what should citizens be looking at? I think that citizens should see through this to know that they are not well thought out policies. They are not uh, backed by evidence or data. And we should stop wasting our time. This is a waste of the taxpayers' money. In fact, one of the things that you'd want to think about when you are kind of uh, formulating policies and you want to implement them is to think about whether these policies are cost effective. Is this a cost effective way to use our natural uh, national resources? Is that a cost effective way of deploying troops who we are spending so much money to um, to keep in the in the field? And I'll tell you, the officer who was in the video, I know him. I mean, that should be Lieutenant Colonel Tenedu. He's a very fine officer, but you could see how he was struggling to really answer the questions that were posed to him because it's indefensible. Let's keep the military out of this whole business. Look, we are risking damaging the image, denting the image of the military. There's so much corruption. There's so much um, you know, political manipulations out there. The military is just going to be set up to fail. And they know this. So they should find ways resisting this kind of um, manipulation. I see. And uh, that bit about uh, the, the reference to what the commander said, um, we, we're going to hear in a bit exactly what the leader of this force, as we're seeing, uh, the commander of the Operation Halt Task Force, General Eric Tenado, this is what he said to the media earlier today. Okay, so the Joint Tax Force has a clear and unambiguous mission of clearing all our water bodies of mining activities. And at this time, we are not looking at uh, whether the person has the required documents or not. So far as you are on our water bodies or you are along the water bodies, you are our target. We are trying to clear off, clear all of them from our water bodies to make sure that our water body return to the normal color that we are all looking for. How long are you going to be stationed within this district? Okay, so the immediate uh, assignment is estimated to last for about two weeks. Then after that, uh, we we'll know what to, to do next, or depending on the instructions and the directives that we we'll receive after that one. Are you surprised that going to about three or four sites so far, you've not seen illegal miners doing active mining? Are you surprised about that? Well, I wouldn't say I'm surprised because uh, one way or the other, uh, they get the information that we are coming, but then sometimes. Uh, before we disembark, we see some of them trying to run and uh, we pursue them, just that we've not been able to arrest any of them. But we've been able to destroy some of the, uh, the, the equipment, uh, like the jam fans and the industrial machines that they use in doing this kind of activities. And so we'll continue and uh, we'll up our game. Dr. Jamal, so that's it there. And, and you, you make the argument, like others, that if the military is giving, quote-unquote, the free hand to work, they can end Galamse within a week. Correct? A lot of things, you know, 
would go on, um, you want to ask yourself, how do the locals perceive this entire venture? Or um, if you simply frame it as a, a security problem and you don't think through it, I mean, you would just have, you know, the locals who are rational actors find ways of circumventing um, some of the mechanisms you put in place. It's as simple as people sitting by the roadside making phone calls that we've seen these guys, um, you know, their vehicles coming in your direction and that's it. And then they leave. The, the miners would leave. It's as simple as that. Simple as you see it and, and how things will play out, but it's not really that simple from what we are seeing right now based on the measures that have been put in place. Dr. Jema Tonswa is a former legal advisor to President Vanguard. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. But let's just say a bit further on this matter because the Ghana Police Service has served notice of a prayer walk happening in Accra tomorrow by the Catholic Church. Um, that's a statement that the Ghana Police Service put out earlier today um, with regards to this particular prayer walk, which we're going to run through uh, in a bit, giving details of this particular statement and um, also how things are playing out ahead of tomorrow. Based on the Ghana Police Service the details, they say that this uh, planned environmental prayer walk by the Catholic Archdiocese of Accra, the Catholic Archdiocese of Accra, uh, scheduled for tomorrow, 11th October 2024. It continues that the prayer walk will begin at the Holy Spirit Cathedral at Dabrakau, which is the converging point, and proceed through Castle Road to the old Electoral Commission office to at reach through the AU runabout, the walk will take the third exit at the AU runabout onto the Independence Avenue, proceeding to Akwaje Interchange. It will then turn right towards the National Police Headquarters traffic light, turn left along uh, Joseph Bros Tito Avenue. It goes on and on, as you see on the screen there. We understand this is a prayer walk, but really, in what form is it going to take? And what are the details as will play out tomorrow? Reverend Father Raymond Osei Tutu is the Chancellor of the Catholic Archdiocese of Accra. They are the ones who are doing this prayer work tomorrow. Uh, Reverend Father Raymond Osei Tutu, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First off, you are asking, among other things, from what I've seen, the President to declare a state of emergency as one of their demands. That was part of the demand of organized labor. That has not been met, at least, from what we, we, we saw yesterday. But they have called off their strike, saying government has met majority of their demands. How does that strike you? Well, it strikes me as, um, I don't know whoever, first of all, we must make a distinction between that the fact that the two are not seen animals, even though we may be looking at the same menace, and we should be asking ourselves, has the devastation stopped? Has our water bodies been resolved? Is our land that is being destroyed solved? So why would anybody want to just call off your strike? They may have their own reasons, so I cannot speak for them. But in our case, we are having a prayer walk that people are dying, water bodies are destroyed, the water levels that are coming to us with the ion levels are dangerous. Can anybody tell me that that has stopped? Does those promises from the government or all responsible persons solve this? There's the need for us to pray for our nation. So as far as the prayer is concerned, and even if everything had, even if the president or whoever has said, I'm going to do everything that we have demanded, we still have to go out and pray for them so that they will be able to do what they have promised to do. Because we all know that, you know, good intentions don't make it to heaven. It's actually by actions, and actual as, actions. Yes. Act, actual actions indeed. Uh, as the saying goes, that even the road to hell is paved with good intentions, is it not? I didn't want to say that, but you said it for me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So tomorrow, God willing, we are all hitting the roads and it is a prayer. It is an environmental prayer walk. We're going to pray to God. We're going to pray to our president and we're going to pray to ourselves that 
we need to collaborate. Otherwise, we are just being irresponsible. And as long as the menace is continuing, this campaign or this cry will not stop. I say, but just a reminder, uh, what are the specific demands in addition to this state of emergency you won't declare that you're asking of the president? Well, we are making a number of demands. We are saying that people are dying. People are dying indiscriminately. Licenses are being allocated and only God knows for what reason. People who have actual licenses are doing not what they have been told to do. Water bodies, which is a no-go area, is being mined. Are these not factual? And who is responsible for them? Now, in any situation, as, as spirituality goes, you know, there are times when you take stock, you have a retreat. So we are saying to whoever and that, please, in the midst of this, why don't we make a short, a temporal halt so that we look at the state of damage, then we'll be able to take a decision. But it looks like all that is being said is that we are going to be doing this, we are going to be doing this, we are going to be doing that. Number one is just promises. Number two, they are just the same old songs that we have been hearing. So we need to pray. We need to pray because our nation is, 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 is heading for the negative. So that's why we, we have to pray. We have to pray for whoever is in charge and we have to pray for ourselves. Because a lot of Catholics, a lot of, well, a lot of Catholics are involved in this. And when you ask them, they're going to be telling you, what should they do? You know, if, um, if everybody would go onto the street and say, we don't have a job to do, therefore allow us to do armed robbery. If there, we don't have jobs to do, therefore allow us to do anything that we want. It's going to be a chaos nation. But just because it is direct money, fact, this is dirty money. This is evil money. This is money that is killing posterity. So ours is to go and pray. Pray, pray, pray. From tomorrow, we're going to step out and it's going to be massive. From the Holy Spirit Cathedral, we are moving. Holy Spirit Cathedral, right. we are moving at 10 o'clock. We are right. gathering at 8 a.m. in the morning going through principal streets of Accra, mm -hmm. would hit towards the Ridge Hospital, go also to the Ridge Runabout, and then move straight to the Canadian Embassy, go in front of the police headquarters. Mm -hmm. And then we'll continue from the uh, fire service and go straight to the Christ the King. When the, when the masses go to the Christ the King Church, some leaders will be chosen to enter the, the premises of the presidency and do a presentation. Let's see, and it's consistent with what the police have just told us. So while, while you're going on this procession, you're gonna be praying to God to touch the heart of the president, to heed to your demands of uh, uh, declaration of a state of emergency and other things, correct? Of course, as we pray in our national anthem, God bless our homeland, Ghana. If we start with we start our national anthem with God, so we must seek God, who in whose name the president has sworn to be the custodian of all minerals that are mined on the earth. And you know, when we say the president, we are not only referring to Nana Ekofuadu. We are referring to the three arms of government. We are we looking at you know all of us chiefs. We are looking at the police. We are looking at everybody. All of us looking at the citizens. Who, st who, who, who stand and say, why are you worrying yourself? It would not work. And yet we are talking about lives. It's mm. sad that if all I can do is to pray, why would you be worried? Why wouldn't you also do what you can do, but rather would spend your time and say and ask me a question, why would I be doing what I'm doing? Why wouldn't you also do something about it? Yes. Indeed. And uh, Reverend Father, appreciate your time. Hopefully your, your, your prayer will, will be heard tomorrow um, and we'll, we'll be with you every step of the way on the streets tomorrow to feed our viewers as well with what is going to be happening with this prayer walk. Thank you. Reverend Father Raymond Osei-Tutu is Chancellor, Catholic Archdiocese of Accra. They're the ones who are putting together this prayer walk tomorrow. 
start at the Holy Spirit Cathedral. Stay with us here on TV3 and across all media general platforms. We will be bringing you updates on that one coming up next after this quick break. Ghana's Africa Cup of Nations hopes now on the ice after a draw against uh, uh, Sudan in, in Accra left the Black Stars third in the group. So really, what's next? Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. The game was the first in Accra since 2021. Think about it. And thousands of fans here in Accra turned up to cheer the Black Stars at the Accra Sports Stadium. Uh, many of them left disappointed. Bilishan spoke to a number of them. They didn't mince words on this. Take a look. Um, what do you make of the game? Oh, Charlie, the players, they, they disappoint with, uh, especially Kudus. See, you, 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 you just imagine. Yeah, here is the ball. And this is the line. Just tap it. Oh. Then you just play the ball to the keeper. How? And me too, me too, my point is that looking at the caliber of players that we have, we realize that in their foreign teams, we see Kudu scoring two goals, Semanyo scoring three goals and assists. But they come here with no passion. Alidu did very well. But right now, the issue is that they don't have the passion anymore. They don't have the passion anymore. They just play like for fun. Keke. They, they did quite well. But I need, what I, I want the coach to do is they should work on their final day. The players, they don't know how to score goals. As, as you, you watch the game, some people came with a winning mentality. But rather than force, you first start Ashmeru. You first start Ashmeru. In terms of possession, yeah, they're not yeah, there. But you're finishing, you're very. Poor, 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 pants, you know. You're best so I'm on channel, I'm on your Jumawa. You're finished because you could have used left so many uh, chances. I ain't the 34 million coaches had a voice, and yeah, we were there to give them that voice. But this is how the, the situation looks like. Take a look uh, in the games and in the, the group that we find ourselves in Ghana, three matches played so far, zero wins, two points. One goal. We are third in that group. And Otuado's record in seven matches, two wins, three draws, two losses. That's, that's his scorecard on the screen there. Sadiq Adams, are you as livid as, as these people we spoke to? Sadiq is joining us on Zoom. Good evening. Um, what's your, your emotional state now? Good evening, Alfred. I, it's not um, a thought for me. Uh, these results keep coming, so I'm not as livid as the fans. And the performance uh, data or graph shows clearly that this is the Black Stars, and we must accept that we do not have a team at this moment. And so uh, we cannot go into games thinking that we are the Ghana of old. Huh? We have to accept and admit that we are an average side. It's an average Ghanaian side. The only thing that uh, keeps this Ghana team going is the legacy, nothing more. It will be difficult for those watching to accept this, this um, narrative, Sadiq, if you say we don't have a team, really. There's Kudus in there, there's, there's Jordan Ayu, there's Jiku, there is uh, uh, Semenyon, there, there is also um, Daniela, I mean, so, so many of them. And Inyaki Williams, these are top strikers in, in Europe. We don't have a team with all these people in there. Yeah, that's that's the that's the confusion and um, uh, let me say the lack of understanding that we we don't have. We have uh, players. We don't have a team. The most important part of a team is the chemistry. Uh, so when we used to have a very strong team and winning ten consecutive games, fifteen consecutive games were the days of Michael Essi and Suleiman Tari, Derek Boateng, John Mensah, John Pencil. They had been together for more than 10 years before they met in the Black Stars, played in the Black Stars for all these years. So you do not sing, single out players. When you have a good team, it's very difficult to point to one player who was outstanding in the game. We need to have a team. Those you have mentioned are players. And that's the lazy man's approach that we've adopted in the last couple of years. We, we hear of a player in Spain, then we fly to go and bring him. We hear of a player in England, we fly to go and bring him. A player is in Turkey performing after five games, we fly to go and bring him. We put them together and two, two days to a game, we expect any coach in charge to, to perform miracles. We have players. We have players who will do well in their clubs. We don't have a team. 
And uh, we cannot keep on doing this. We need to build a concept. We need to build a strategy. We need to build a culture, a winning culture that is very, uh, I mean, online with, in line with what Ghana wants to play. We have to start building that from the base. And people want the national team to win, I understand, but we need to work hard like we used to do in the past. The only thing that can save Ghana now is to go back to the drawing board because we, we are at the, I mean, crossroad. This is the lowest we can get. We started from winning the AFCON to get into the finals to get into semi-finals a couple of times, then to quarter-finals, we dropped to the round of 16. The last previous, two previous African Cup of Nations, we crashed out of the group stages. Uh, and we, we were beaten by Minos, Mozambique, Comoros, and Niger. These are the, the, the lowest teams in the, in, in, the, in the ranking of African football. They are beating us. So the difficulty is that we have to accept and admit that Ghana is now an average side for years, and we can only get back if we uh, go back to the drawing board. It's a sad reality. Black stars of Ghana, average. But today, the pitch was good, so we couldn't blame it on the pitch. What went wrong? Yeah, it wasn't uh, the best of pitches. But um, like I've said, there is no chemistry in the team. Right. And so no motivational quotes and inspiration can, can uh, ex ex excite the team to finally start playing like we used to do. What was wrong today was that and that has been wrong for all these years. There's no chemistry. Kudus plays well, but there's no telepathy between him and Inaki. The same for Anton Semenyo. They do well in their clubs, but when they come here, they only arrive two days before a game, sometimes a day before a game. So you don't coach at the national team. You manage a concept that has been there. Whoever you put in will play. Now we are two points after three games, two <clears throat> out of nine. Uh, this is the worst start. This is the worst start to an African Cup of Nations qualifier since 2004, when we failed to qualify for the African Cup of Nations hosted in Tunisia. So in 20 years, this is our worst start. The qualification for Afcon used to be a best right for Ghana. We would just qualify, but this is the toughest, and I expected that we would get here. But the verdict of Otuado is that the team played well. We deserve to win. Sudan just got lucky. That's his verdict. Well, I, I have said this uh, after the game. Sudan decided to sit back. The Sudan that I know and the Kosiapia, they do well when they travel. So what I said was that Kosiapia brought a strategy that he didn't want to beat Ghana. If the Sudanese had decided to open up the game like the Angolans did in the last 15 minutes of the game, it would have been disastrous for us. That's the fact. So Tuado is saying this practically because the Sudanese decided to set back. You clearly can see that they gave us a lot of balls. They failed to take initiatives into Ghana's half. They, they came for a draw. And if a team sets out for a strategy and is able to successfully achieve that, it tells you that the opposition is weak. So it's not that the Ghanaian team played well, but the Sudanese team came with a strategy to secure a draw. If they had wanted to open up the game, and you will see them uh, in, the, in the return leg. They are a very tough side with uh, full of stamina and uh, a, a lot of um, I mean, conditioning. So they decided to sit back. If they had opened up, I'm sure we will not be talking about uh, them having luck and uh, I mean, coming to Ghana and the Ghanaian team doing well. We did not do well because the Sudanese team came with a strategy that worked for them. Sadiq, I appreciate you. So the return leg is in five days, yeah? Correct? Yeah, great stuff. Do have a good night, brother, and uh, we'll talk again. Great. Sadiq Adams um, is a sports journalist, celebrated sports journalist, uh, joining us here on Ghana Tonight. And I want to say thank you so much for staying with us. On behalf of the rest of the team, we do appreciate your company. I am Alfred Okansi. Do have a good night.